Hello, this is your professor, Mr. Ellsworth. This uh, video series is in support of my CIS 5 class, Programming Concepts and Mythology 1, using C++, and Introduction to Computers and Programming for Moreno Valley College. So let's get started. So today we're going to introduce the C++ language by writing a simple program. Our objectives is to know the integrated development environment as a tool to help us write programs. In this course, we're using Visual Studios. We need to recognize the different types of programs, to understand the concept of a data type, and to know the parts of a microcomputer system. Our essential question, how do we start to create a computer program to solve a problem? Some keywords to uh, watch out for, listen for. Program, hardware, software, CPU, main memory, secondary storage, input device, output device. When you work as a programmer, uh, you'll be working in a programming team uh, for most jobs today. Why program? Computer. Programmable machine designed to follow instructions. Program instructions in the computer memory to make it do something. Programmer is the person who writes the instructions or programs to make a computer perform a task. So without programmers, no programs. Without programs, the computer cannot do anything. Visual Studios is the environment, the integrated development environment that we're using for this course. In the computer lab, we'll be using uh, the C++ console application template. It's a two-step process to get started, which I'll show you in just a little bit. A free version of Visual Studios can be downloaded from the Microsoft Website for your laptop or PC computer. Visual Studios Community 2019 is the current one available. Um, there's another website. If you don't have a PC and you're working from a Chromebook, you can still learn how to program by using a website called repl.it. You can create a free account there and you can write C++ programs. Um, some limitations with online coding. All of the code has to be included in one module, uh, so you won't be able to create multiple modules. Uh, Visual Studios, uh, first time you use Visual Studios, it will ask you to select a development environment. Um, you should choose the C++ development environment, but should you accidentally choose the wrong one, don't panic because when you open a new project, you can select the environment that you want. Um, it's a one-time setup requirement. So, <clears throat> problem solving. Computer programming. Computer is a powerful tool. It is not intelligent. In order to use computers to solve our problems, we must tell it what we want done and in, or in order in which we want it done. These instructions are called computer programs. This process is called computer programming. The person giving these instructions is called the computer programmer. Okay. And you can see uh, the flow of creating a program. We have input, we have some kind of processing, and output. Okay. The elements of C++, C++ programs. Programmers develop solutions to problems using a programming language. We will examine the rules and symbols that make up the C++ programming language. We will also review the steps required to create a program and make it work on a computer. What are the five major hardware components of a computer system? We have the CPU, which contains an arithmetic logic unit. We have our main memory, 
where we load the programs into before we execute them. We have a secondary storage device, which could be an SSD today or on older computers, a uh, disk drive. We have some kind of input device like a mouse and a keyboard. We have some kind of output device such as a um, the display screen or a printer or for that matter audio. Main hardware component categories we have, you can see some devices here, uh, camera, joystick, scanner, keyboard, camera, um, disk drive, screen, printer, speakers. Central processing unit or the CPU is comprised of two parts, the control unit, and that retrieves and decodes instructions from memory and coordinates the activities of the computer. The arithmetic logic unit is hardware optimized for high-speed numeric calculations. Uh, hardware is designed for true-false, yes-no decisions. The computer runs purely on binary, which we refer to as ones and zeros, but it's electrical voltages in this day and age, um, around 3.3 volts for a one and around 0 0.7 volts for uh, a zero. Um, <clears throat> okay. Again, the CPU is broken up into the two units, the arithmetic logic unit and the control unit. The control unit uh, controls fetching the next instruction and feeding it in, decoding it, and telling the arithmetic unit what kind of processing to do, what kind of output, and where it's going. Okay. Uh, main memory. It's volatile. You turn the power off, it goes away. Um, back when I first started with computers, they were still using something called core memory, which were little tiny rings, um, maybe a sixteenth of an inch in diameter, with some wires uh, going through it, and they would magnetize the ring in uh, one direction or the other, so that um, counterclockwise would be a one and clockwise would be a zero. Um, and in those particular systems back then, um, when you turn the power off, the program still remained in memory. And so when you turn the power back on, you could still execute it. And that's because the memory was magnetically stored on those rings. Um, those were kind of expensive compared to semiconductor memory and didn't have anywhere near the density. Um, <clears throat> and so they gave way... Uh, to semiconductor memory, which of course, when when the supply voltage goes off, it it forgets, right? Um, and we refer to it as random access memory, um, and it's organized as follows: um, a bit is the smallest piece of memory has a value of zero or one. A byte is eight consecutive bits. And bytes have addresses. On the original PCs, that was a 16-bit address, which could address 64K of memory. And of course, you know, today is much larger. Um, this particular computer has 8 gigabytes of uh, memory and has six processors. Um, main memory. Uh, address, each byte in memory is identified by a unique number known as an address. And it starts at zero. And you can see here we have uh, memory locations. Um, here we have 149 stored in location 16. We have a 72 stored in location 23 in main memory. Now this portion of main memory would uh, probably be uh, the BIOS ROM, which is read-only memory, which has the startup or boot-up program for the computer. 
and it gets going, it loads the operating system into main memory and then uh, the operating system takes over. System software consists of operating system, utility program, software development tools. For example, Visual Studio's integrated development environment would be a system software program. The operating system on this particular computer is Windows 10. There are other operating systems such as uh, you know Linux and iOS for the Apple devices. Secondary storage. This is a non-volatile storage. That, that means um, when the power goes away, it retains its memory. Um, this particular computer has one terabyte of SSD, uh, which is solid state uh, memory of a type that doesn't uh, forget when the power goes away. It also has a one terabyte uh, hard disk. Um, and it comes in a variety of ways. We used to use floppy disks, which were flexible disks. Um, they stayed with the IBM PCs and compatibles um, way longer than their usefulness, um, which was only 1.44 uh, megabytes of storage on those uh, floppy disks. But even earlier floppy disks stored even less. Uh, there was a five and a quarter inch uh, size floppy disk that you could easily bend in your hand, and that one would store 360K of memory. That's it. Um, other storage devices, um, you know, the CD-ROM drive um, using CDs, um, and also you can use flash drives connected to the USB port. Um, I have a couple of one terabyte uh, uh, USB uh, drives that I use uh, for backing up my main computer. Okay, input devices. Uh, the two that we use the most is the mouse and the keyboard. Uh, this microphone that I'm talking to you on is an input device. Uh, there are many, many devices that can provide input. Uh, there's a digital camera here that you can see uh, my smiling face here. Um, Disk drives, CD drives, and DVD drives can be considered input devices as well, uh, as long as they're as well as their storage uh, functions. Uh, output devices, uh, the display screen is is the main one. Uh, printers, uh, writing to a, a CD drive, writing to your hard drive. Those all output uh, functions. Software programs that run on a computer. We have, we basically break software down into two groups. We have the operating system or system software, which contains, you know, like operating systems such as Windows, Linux, and Unix um, application software, which is like, for example, uh, Word, Excel. Uh, programs like that, game programs. Um, application software, these are programs that people normally spend most of their time running on their computers. Includes examples Microsoft Office, Google Docs, Zoom, uh, PyCharm, which is a nice integrated development uh, environment. Uh, programs and programming languages. Uh, a program is a set of instructions that the computer follows to perform a task. And we're learning about the C++ programming language, but there are hundreds of different programming languages in the world, uh, many of them with very specialized applications. Now, C++ is uh, very efficient and, and fast uh, once it's uh, compiled. Um, Another language uh, that you might be familiar with is Java. Not quite as fast because it uh, compiles down to an intermediate language, which is then interpreted. And it's pretty quick, but it's not as quick as C++. And then um, there's language like, for example, Python, which is interpreted and is quite a bit slower than C++ or Java, but is very, very powerful. 
And of course, there's many, many other languages. You know, there's the R language, Ruby, uh, Swift, um, Google's created a language called Go, and so on. And as time goes on, more languages will be developed for very specific uh, applications and problems that need to be solved. And when programming, we start with an alg algorithm, which is a set of well-defined steps. Um, here's a sample of an algorithm for calculating gross pay. Um, display a message on the screen uh, asking, how many hours did you work? Uh, wait for the user to enter the number of hours worked. Once the user has entered a number, store it in memory. Display a message on the screen asking, how much do you get paid per hour? Wait for the user to enter an hourly pay rate. Once the user enters a number stored in memory. Multiply the number of hours by the amount paid per hour and store the results in memory. And finally, display a message on the screen that uh, tells the amount of money earned. The message must include the results of the calculation performed in step five. Now let's jump down to lower level in the computer machine language. The ones and zeros that are stored in memory, which has our program, is machine code or machine language. And this is the only language that the actual hardware in the computer understands. And the computer only executes uh, machine language. Um, fortunately, we don't have to interpret the ones and zeros. That's a very, very difficult task to do. Um, I had to do it once in my working career. And it took me about a month to do not that big of a program, but it took a while to decode everything manually. Uh, machine languages are binary numbers such as this, and you can see how easy that would be to remember, right? So um, rather than writing programs in machine language, programmers use programming language. And the first languages was like assembly language, which used mnemonics like uh, MOV for move. So you move <coughs> an input number to uh, register uh, AX, you know, things like that. Uh, it has, you know, add instruction, subtract, all those kinds of things. And then um, it took a lot of instructions, um, that was assembly language instructions, to do any real work. So uh, very quickly, higher level languages were developed. Um, IBM developed Fortran. Um, I think the government sponsored development of COBOL. I know Grace Hooper, Admiral Grace Hooper, was heavily involved with the COBOL language. Um, she incidentally was the oldest serving admiral in the United States Navy. Uh, programs and programming languages, um, types of language, low level used for communication with computer hardware directly, often written binary machine code zeros and one, high level, closer to humans, uh, language easier for us to understand and to write uh, our programs. Uh, a few programs here, you know, C++, very, very important language in the world. Basic, uh, Ruby, Java, C Sharp, it's becoming more popular. COBOL, Fortran, those are older languages. Um, there was PL1 that IBM had put out that I learned, oh, back in the late 70s. The C language was the predecessor to C++. Python, JavaScript. <coughs> So a variety of, of different languages. I learned, um, my first programming language that I learned was when I was in high school and that first uh, summer school, they offered a course in basic. And I took it over the summer and uh, it was my first exposure to computer programming. Um, I didn't see computer programming again until I got to college and I, uh, and I was, uh, engineering degree, so I learned the Fortran, Fortran 4 specifically language. Okay, 
uh, from high level program to an executable file. So we create our source file containing the programs with a text editor or this day and age uh, integrated development environment. Run the preprocessor to convert source files uh, directives to source code program statements. The preprocessor, there's something uh, hashtag includes a different uh, like uh, library files that we need to include with our program. And that's taken care of in the preprocessing step. Uh, then run the compiler to convert the source program into machine instructions. Uh, this is a binary, but it's not a binary that will actually execute on the computer. Then we run a linker to connect hardware-specific code to machine instructions, pursuing, uh, producing an executable files. All the libraries um, binaries are linked in at this step. Um, steps B through D are often performed by a single command or button click. Errors detected at any step will prevent execution of the uh, following steps. Um, the integrated development environments, as you type your code in, will catch a lot of the syntax errors uh, in the code. But we have two types of errors in our code. We have syntax errors and we have logical errors. And the compiler um, or the IDE, they can't catch those logic errors. And that's something that uh, you have to figure out. Uh, and here's a flowchart of, uh, of what we just talked about. Source code, preprocessor, modify source code, compiler, object code, linker, and finally our executable program. Um, these steps are all handled in the IDE for us, not like the old days where we had to actually have job control, little scripting programs to uh, uh, compile and link our programs together. Um, Integrated development environments, um, they save us a lot of work. You will grow to appreciate, appreciate the IDEs uh, because any uh, syntactical errors you make, you know, they highlight. Um, the one we're using is Microsoft's Visual Studio for C++. Um, it also includes other, you know, you can download other languages uh, such as uh, C Sharp and... Um, Python is now available on there. Turbo C++, Explorer, Code Warrior, etc. I mean, NetBeans is a very popular one for the Java uh, development environment. I used PyCharm for when I was doing a Python class. Um, and there are many, many of them. Uh, and, and the tools are just getting better all the time. So next thing you know, the IDEs will start writing the programs for us. Uh, here's a, a little a screenshot of um, the Visual Studio uh, IDE and where you have your files. This can show up on either side. I think they show up on the right side on my uh, Visual Studios. Um, your source code uh, window and then there's a variety of different things you can display down here. Uh, from your output, I usually have the errors displayed down here, so if I make a mistake that I didn't catch, um, I can double-click on it and jump right to that spot so I can take care of it. Okay, let's talk about identifiers. Um, identifiers are used to label our variables. Um, also to label functions and classes and other things. Um, it has to start with a letter or the underscore. Now, typically the underscore is reserved for like system programming stuff. You may see some um, Microsoft code and they start with uh, the underscore. Um, and then after that, the identifier can contain letters, numbers, and the underscore. And so here's some examples of uh, identifiers. Sum of squares, right? You can't have any blank spaces in your um, uh, identifiers. And the characters have to all run together. So uh, back in the day when we wanted to separate 
variable names that were made up of words, we'd separate them with the underscore like this. This is kind of falling out of practice now as we use something called camel case, uh, which I don't have an example of here, but camel case is it starts with a lower case like this one, but the G would be lower case, and we get data and then each word is capitalized. Um, that's the more popular way of um, doing identifiers now. Uh, but J9 is legal, box underscore 22A is legal, bin 3D4 count. Okay. Uh, why are these identifiers invalid? Well, the rule is it has to start with a letter. So does that one start with a letter? No. It starts with a number, so it's not valid. Get data. Well, what's the problem here? Well, there's a space there, right? Identifiers can't have spaces. Box dash 22. Dash is a special character. It's actually used for subtraction. And, and the reason it can't be used is the compiler is now confused. Is it BOX minus 22? Yeah. So special characters are excluded except for the underscore. Cost in dollars. Well, here they have underscores. That's okay. But the dollar sign is not okay. There is a language where dollar sign is okay, and that's the Fortran language. It was an extra character allowed in Fortran. Um, I haven't seen it in any other languages. Um, and I've done a fair number of languages, and so probably shouldn't even mention that. And then int. This is a reserved word. Uh, in C++, and so you can't use a reserve word as an identifier. Okay, and we can see here. And variables. Variables hold data. Like a, Think of it like a mailbox that holds one letter, you know, one piece of data. So the data goes in, data can be removed, new data can be put in, it overwrites the old data when that's done. But we can have many, many variables, so we don't have to worry about um, uh, overwriting useful uh, data. Back in the old days, when I first started programming, uh, there are machines I programmed that had a limit of 4,096 bytes of memory. That's it. And they used to do things like uh, packing data and, and other things, reusing a variable, very dangerous practice. But you had a very hard limit, and that was back in those days. Memory was very expensive. <clears throat> uh, and so they um, kept the sizes as small as, as, as practical for the application. Uh, and of course, you know, that's no longer true. Uh, you can have very, very large memory models to work with today. So you still should be as efficient as possible because, for example, if you use um, uh, integers can be defined as ints and longs. Longs is twice as big. Well, if you have a large array of longs when an uh, array of integers would work, then you're wasting memory, but more importantly, you're wasting CPU cycles when it goes to retrieve that data. Okay, Data types. Well, we talked about an integer data type, and I just mentioned the long data type, which is a double-sized uh, integer. An uh, integer in, in the CPU is uh, 32 bits and the double is uh, 64 bits and you can st store fairly large integers um, about um, a regular int will store up to about two and a half billion the most significant bit of those 32 bits is called the sign bit data is by default sign data so you have plus or minus so when the most significant bit is a zero that means it's a positive number and when that most significant bit is a one, it's a negative number. You can have, you can declare an unsigned int so that you get the full range of all 32 bits. 
uh, without using the sign bit that's available. Um, and then you can just upgrade to a long, which gives you 64 bits. And I don't know how large of a number that comes out, but it's like uh, 2 to the 63rd power, uh, which is pretty big. Um, variables are names for memory locations. So when you declare an integer variable, a memory location is assigned. Actually, it would be 32 bits or 4 bytes of data. Um, each variable is defined as a data type. We have uh, we have uh, floating point and double for um, decimal numbers. Um, for example, we use float and it one four uh, point one five. The F indicates it should be stored as a float. That's a characteristic of the C++ compiler, if you don't put the F there, it'll actually uh, upgrade it to a double. Uh, char uh, is used for storing single characters like the letter A or the letter B and so on. Um, it can also duplicate as an 8-bit uh, integer number. Uh, <clears throat> And it's sometimes used for that purpose. Um, we probably won't do that. But if you really need to, to increase your efficiency and really pack the data together, and that's, I've mentioned packed data before. And so our memory is uh, organized in, in the form of words of uh, 32 bits or 64 bits. And when you're using uh, packed data, instead of just storing one char character in that 32-bit location, um, we can pack four char characters into that 32 bits. Strings um, is like an array of chars. So you have a whole series of um, text stored as character data and uses, there's one additional character at the end called the null character. The null character is the value 0, and it's used to uh, indicate the end of the string because strings are variable length. Bool for Boolean data, and this has a value of uh, true or false. Okay. Um, what is a program made up? Common elements in programming languages. We have keywords, programmer-defined identifiers, operators. It would be like a plus, minus, multiply, punctuation, and syntax. Okay, here's an example of a program. Um, this is uh, the one we talked about, about calculating uh, gross users' gross pay, right? And um, this is a comment, which we're saying what the name of the program is. This is a preprocessor directive. The hashtag means preprocessor. Include IO stream. We need to include IO stream if we want to use C out and C in because they're contained in that particular library. Using namespace standard, um, IO stream is tied to the programming namespace called STD. Um, if we didn't include this line, then we'd have to do std colon colon c out std colon colon c in um, that's five extra characters that i don't want to type so every program every c plus plus program has a main a function main uh, it's declared as an integer function the name is main and all in lowercase the parentheses indicate it is a function the curly brace opens up the block of code. The closing curly brace ends the block of code of our program. That would be the end of the program right there. We have some variables declared here. And you can see we write a message to the screen, and then we read in the data. Write a message to the screen, read in the data. Then we do the calculation. And then finally, uh, re report our calculation results. A very basic uh, program. Okay. Keywords, also known as reserved words. 
They have special meaning in C++, cannot be used for any other programming purpose. Keywords in program 1-1 using namespace int double and return. Uh, C in and C out would also be uh, uh, reserved words uh, because they're associated with IO stream. Uh, any others? Okay. Um, so they circled the keywords here. Programmer defined identifiers, names made up by the programmer, not part of the C++ language, used to represent various things such as variables, functions, and so on. We have hour, rate, and pay, which were variables that we created. And you can see where they're used in the program. Operators. Uh, we have arithmetic operators like plus, minus. We use the asterisk for multiply. And that's above the 8 on your keyboard. We use the uh, slash, um, which is uh, below the question mark on your keyboard. And then the equal sign is a special operator called the assignment operator. Not exactly the same as the algebraic equals. Similar, but not the same. Okay. Uh, some other operators um, are these angle brackets used for uh, data flow. Okay. And he circles them here. Punctuation. Um, our program used the comma and the semicolon. Um, almost every program statement ends in a semicolon. Uh, the exception will be the um, if statement. Uh, there's a few, ex uh, a handful of exceptions. But in the case of if statement, um, we could have curly braces, open, close curly braces for a block of code, although that's not required either. Um, and then uh, some of the looping statements. Okay, uh, commas here. I typically don't write my variables like this. I identify my variables on separate lines. Um, syntax, rules of grammar that must be followed when writing a program, controls the use of keywords, operators, programmer defined symbols, and punctuation. A variable is a name uh, storage location in the computer's memory for holding a piece of data. Um, you know, we could uh, access our data by using its numerical address, but that's much more difficult to remember. Uh, a name is much easier. So we had, um, in program 1-1, we had hours, we had rate, and we had pay. Okay. Um, variable definitions. Um, in the program, we use double for hours, rate, and pay. Again, I always do it on separate lines. Um, there are many different uh, data types that we'll learn about. <clears throat> um, a variable holds a very specific type of data type. These data types are called primitive data types. Um, and later on, um, we'll learn about creating our own data types using an enum. Uh, variable definition uh, specifies the type of data variable can hold and the variable name. Okay. Once again, line seven, that's our declaration for the variables. Often I do two things with it. Um, for example, I do double hours equals zero, semicolon. Double rate equals zero, semicolon. Double pay equals zero, semicolon. I define and give it an initial value. In C++, a default value is not a sign. Just a memory location is a sign. And whatever data just happens to be in that memory location is the data you're going to get. Okay. Now, those of you who know Java, well, you know that uh, Java will initialize the variables for you. Um, 
Visual Basic initializes the variables. Um, Python, they don't have a variable declaration. Um, when you create your variable, you're assigning a value to it, and so it, it identifies the data type by um, its use. The word double specifies that variables can hold double precision floating point numbers. We'll learn more about those later. Data types is important to learn that the data types, uh, what they are, when they're used, how much memory they use. Um, perhaps not quite as important today because we have large memory models as it was in the past. But to make your program as efficient as possible, you should use the smallest data type that will actually work for your specific operation. Um, when you get involved in arrays, you know, and it becomes a choice of array of integers versus an array of longs. Now, a longs you know, is twice as big as an integer. So if you're doing it as um, all of the pixels on the screen, well, you know, that's millions of pixels. Uh, pixels. Uh, so it can add up really, really fast. And you can slow down the computer. So, um, some takeaways for today. Uh, we use Visual Studios EDE to write our programs. A computer program is a list of instructions that tell the computer what to do. And variables are used to hold data elements. Now, let me show you um, how to do Visual Studios. Um, you can download it from the Microsoft website, but. Visual Studios 2017, we open it up. As I said, creating a program was a two-step process. Um, so we do new project, right? And we give it a name. And don't use the default. The default names are project one, project two, project three. Um, you don't want to do that. I usually label mine because I do multiple languages. Um, I use CPP to indicate uh, a C++ program, then I give it a name. And this is, um, let's call it um, sample hello world. And you can see I used, um, I ran the, the, the words together. I started as an empty project. Click on OK. And then, like I said, it was a two-step process to start. So we have to go over here to um, uh, Project. And we have to add an item, add new item. And we're going to add a C++ file. And here you can leave the name as source. And then we can do our program. So we can put a comment in, uh, sample program, hello world. Hello world was the um, uh, default uh, kind of program that you first ran on a new system. And another thing that you should do is always put your name. and the date. Like that. Now let's put our include. Notice no semicolon on this line. Remember I said we need a namespace. So using namespace standard, that one does get a semicolon. Misspelled stream. That should be an S. Notice how the IDE uh, caught the error and showed it up in red. You know, a little squiggly line in red. And that indicates you made a syntax error. Uh, we need an init main. All programs have an init main. The parentheses indicate it's a function. And it has a set of curly braces. And often I'll do this. Uh, end of main. 
Um, <clears throat> the end of my curly braces, a lot of times I will label them. And then here we're going to uh, print out. So we're going to print out. So see out. Uh, we want the angle brackets go in the direction of data flow. Hello world. Like that. Closing parenthesis. Now there's one other thing we have to do for um, this is kind of specific to Visual Studios. Uh, it depends on your IDE that you're using for your development. But we have to put something in called system pause. Otherwise what happens is the program will flash on the screen, you know, it'll open up a, a window, you flash the program on there, and if it's really fast, you won't even see it at all. Um, but it flashes on the screen and then it's gone. So, like this. Okay. And then I'll press the Control key and hold it, and the Function 5 key at the very top of the keyboard to compile and run the program. Maybe. So it's doing something. And it can see it printed a little world on there. Let me make this a little bigger. Um, 24. So it said hello world. And then when I press this, I can show you if I don't have that system pause there, let's comment it out and run it. You may not even see the flash. No, I didn't. This one's fast enough. I didn't see the flash. On slower computers, you can see it flash on the screen and then it's gone. So that's why we use system pause. Um, system. It's not really a C++ um, directive. This is um, something that Visual Studios has added. Um, it's available in some IDEs, uh, but not all. And sometimes you may have to use a trick to cause the uh, program window from terminating, the console window from terminating. OK, well, that's all I wanted to show you for this lesson. Um, And just exit out. And uh, so this is the end of this lesson. Until the next lesson, bye-bye.